picture's worth a thousand words, right? So I've got two videos that are just going to wow you and get, kind of get you in the mood to ask questions later. And this is really not about me in San Antonio. It's about what happens here in Cook County in Chicago. And so we, we've had people visit from all over the world, seven different countries, and most states have come to visit. In fact, there was a delegation, I think last week, Mark uh, was there and some other folks. And uh, they're always impressed with our programs, but the thing they said is, how did you get everybody to work together? So we're going to talk a little bit about how you bring your community together and come up with your plan, because that's what it's, what's important, is, is, is uh, how you come up with your method, your plan, because when you develop it, and you track it, you make good things happen for everybody. So I'm going to talk a lot about how you develop that culture of partnership and collaboration. It's one of several police shootings involving people with mental illness. 18-year-old Keith Bidell struggled with schizophrenia. He wasn't violent, and all they wanted was help getting him to treatment. Seconds later, the officer shot and killed him. They murdered our son for no reason. Another disturbing video that raises questions about the treatment of the mentally ill behind bars. He would hear voices. The extraction team restrained him. Minutes later, the 33-year-old was dead. Jails are the number one mental health facilities across the country. They house more mentally ill person versus any hospital, any psych facilities, any anything. They're patients, not prisoners. Mental illness is the only disease that when you're in a crisis, the cops are called. If you're having a heart attack, you don't call the police. People with mental illness are being criminalized instead of being provided treatment. These kind of jails and law enforcement, that's a public safety net. That's where you end up. There has to be some sort of solution, some sort of help for people who are suffering from mental illness and become involved with the police. Jeff was the youngest of our four. He was finally diagnosed a paranoid schizophrenic when he was totally out of control and very frightening. I would have to call the police on him. They didn't know what to do. I have a call back for 862 Central. I would get calls all the time when I was on patrol for a person who was in a mental health crisis. I had no clue how to handle it. And I would just keep getting the repeat calls every couple days or every week to the same house, the same person. And I just accepted it that, well, oh, this person's just going to be a repeat caller. We decided very early on that we needed to address folks that were nonviolent misdemeanor offenders that were truly being put in jail because of their illness. We knew that it was law enforcement that were first responders and that they would be the ones that would be in contact with individuals in crisis. So we decided what we would do first is train law enforcement officers in 40-hour crisis intervention training. So they're trained to recognize mental illness. When they come up on somebody that's got kind of strange behavior, they're not using their command voice and the command presence like they're taught in the academy. They realize right away that this person has a problem. We brought together a bunch of law enforcement officers from the sheriff and the San Antonio Police Department and every one of them didn't want to be there. I heard things like, I'm a cop, I'm not a social worker, I don't believe in these hug -a thug programs, and this is a bunch of BS. Before I went through the 40-hour CIT training myself, I didn't have the resources on how to handle a mental illness. Well now, it's way different. You know, I have confidence that when I go into someone's home, if they are experiencing some type of you know, mental health crisis, that I can get them to the right facility and then I may never hear from them again. I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, I'm a voter, I'm a volunteer, I'm all these people. I contribute to my community and I have a mental illness. My diagnosis is major depression with psychotic features, dissociative identity disorder, and panic disorders. I've done the presentations to CIT training. And I tell them, I want to be treated the way you want your mother to be treated if she was ever diagnosed with a mental illness. If I'm in a crisis, you know, I'm having a crisis and I don't, I, I don't understand what's going on around me. In incidents with people who have mental health issues, it's unfortunate to see the ones that result in the use of deadly force where an officer didn't have 
CIT training and possibly armed with that kind of information, that kind of training, outcomes may have been different. I never knew each morning when I got up what I might find. He began to talk about a fire in the garage. So I thought, would he, without knowing what he's doing, start a fire? How much danger is he in and how much danger am I in? So I called the police and I said, I'm terribly frightened. When they arrived, I introduced them to Jeff, and in this case, they came in plain clothing. They weren't in police uniforms. Now, they could have handcuffed him, I guess, and pulled him out, but they are taught how different that person is that they're dealing with. So they began to talk to Jeff. If they can get the person that's ill to, in their own mind, they're cooperating. It's far less violent. It's better for the patient, and certainly it's better for our police. When nonviolent people go to jail with mental illness, they say it's three or four times longer than a violent offender. But if, when they get released, if they're not hooked up into treatment, they're going to be right back in. There are so many people in their emergency rooms who shouldn't be there. The previous police chief here has actually kept data on how long his officers were spending in emergency rooms waiting for psych evals and medical clearance, eight to 14 hours. He spent $600,000 a year in overtime. Now here at the Restoration Center, the law enforcement officers are in and out within 15 minutes. What we have here at the Restoration Center is services for patients who are in crisis. It's either walk in or brought in here by a CIT. They recognize the patient's in crisis. They're not truly suicidal. They don't really want to hurt somebody. They just need help. There are about 18,000 people a year who are brought mainly by law enforcement officers to this restoration center who used to go to jail or emergency rooms or put back on the street. If you're a taxpayer and really don't know a lot about mental illness, the fact that the public's a lot safer when these people get treated and the taxpayer saves a ton of money. Over the last uh, five years, we've saved about $50 million in taxpayers' dollars. But we want everyone trained because of the potential daily that someone's going to come across someone who's in crisis. It's not a matter of if, uh, it's a matter of how soon. We've been coming up on six years uh, of existence, and we don't have a use of force on our, on our unit which means we've never tased anybody, uh, we've never shot anybody, we've never hit anybody with an asp, but patients, talking to them, we get the result we want in the end and we don't have to force it on them. You want CIT to respond because you're going to get the help that you need rather than be sent to jail. The issues that police officers have with people who have mental illness is not unique to San Antonio. That's all over the country, all over the world. So any city that would decide to focus on this, put an emphasis on this, would certainly benefit from it. I no longer thought, what if they have to shoot Jeff? We save money, we improve public safety, and uh, people can get functional again. I mean, why wouldn't you do this? It's really uh, a no-brainer. So, no-brainer is a, a Texas word. It refers to our current governor, who, who did not accept the affordable health care dollars, by the way. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Better? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so, you heard me say 18,000 people were brought to the crisis center. I'm going to show you the next film. It's going to say uh, 13. Actually, when we did the film, there were 1,100 people a month brought to the crisis center. So uh, this uh, roll call video is done by law enforcement officers and it's taken to all the law enforcement substations and thrown at all, shown at all three sh shifts quarterly. And so when we first showed it, it jumped from 1,100 people brought uh, to the crisis center rather than taken to jail or emergency rooms or put back on the street homeless. 
uh, we showed the film and jumped to 1300. So we redid the film, and hey, Brittany, uh, uh, the Barry, you'll see, she says, I think 13. I just said 18. We're up to over 2,000 people a month, over 24,000 people a year who are brought to treatment rather than going to jail or emergency room. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is the roll call video. And you, know, you have to understand, uh, how many of you wrote the, read the book Crazy by Pete Early? Uh, a bunch of you have. So this is about a family whose son went off to college and like a lot of people, he had his first psychotic break when he was in college. And so he was walking down the street and he saw a house and he thought it was his house. So he went in and took a bubble bath. The, fam the family came home and found this strange young man and they called the police. Well, he was very competitive. He wanted the police to get out of his house. He wanted these strange people. So they arrested him. They only arrested him. They beat the hell out of him and took him to jail. So the family, you know, we, they got him out, and he was at home, and of course, you know, he, he had no insight because he was so sick, and he was refusing treatment. So the early family called the police and say, you know, my, my son won't come out of his room. You know, he's, he's saying all these strange things. He's not sleeping. He won't eat. You know, uh, can you come and help him? And they said, well, is he dangerous? Is he a threat to himself or others? Well, no. Is he willing to get treatment? Well, no. Well, I'm sorry. Call us when he is. So they decided, you know, they just had to get uh, their son some help. So they fabricated a story. My son hit my wife. You need to come and take him and get him some help. He's ill. They came all right. The kid resisted, uh, you know, uh, the, the law enforcement officers. The same thing happened. You know, he got roughed up, put in jail, no help. So uh, Mr. Early wrote a book, which he got an honorable Pulitzer Prize recognition for, and, and the name of the book's Crazy. And it's not about his son, it's about our system and you know, the terrible things that happen and how you know, we're so disconnected that we can't treat people with illnesses in an appropriate way. So law enforcement has a lot of contact, you know, whether it's a mental health warrant or whether you know, they're, they're confronting somebody on the street that's homeless, that's psychotic, so uh, one of our real partners uh, is law enforcement. And I, and I said in the film, the first crisis intervention training we had, every law enforcement officer in the place was made to be at the training. And none of them wanted to be there. And I, I did. I heard things like, I'm a, a cop, not a social worker. I don't believe in these hug thug programs. Uh, so uh, I went up on the first break and talked to the guy that was most hostile. And I said, do you have encounters with people with mental illness? And he said, yeah. How about last night? And I said, last night? And he said, yeah, I haven't been to bed yet. Yeah, well, that's one reason, you know, he's, he's kind of distraught and angry. And uh, he said, yeah. He said, I had an encounter last night. He said, I was called to McDonald's on the south side of San Antonio for disturbing the peace. He said, I rolled up on the restaurant. The night manager met, met me at the door. The place was empty. And I walked in, and there was a guy in the corner screaming the Lord's Prayer. So I got him outside. He saw my uniform. He got a little loose, and I said, what are you doing? You know, screaming like that. And he said, well, I have these thoughts. Uh, you know, I hear these voices, and when I say the Lord's Prayer, it makes me feel better. So I asked the officer, what would you do with him? I said, what do you mean, what did I do with him? He said, I took him to jail. I couldn't leave him there because I'm afraid he'd hurt himself or somebody else. You know, I, I knew if I took him to the emergency room that I'd be shackled. Because remember the police chief Ortiz? He actually kept data on how long his officers were in emergency rooms waiting for psych evals and, and medical clearance, 8 to 14 hours. Spent $600,000 in overtime. So he said, that's just what I want to do is be shackled to somebody, you know, for eight hours screaming the Lord's Prayer. Then I have to take him to jail anyway because there's no community alternative. Okay, so you can see the, the problem. So uh, now we've turned that, you know, that was 12 years ago. We've turned it upside down. We have these wonderful partnerships. We have, you know, like Thresholds and, and uh, all the other great services you have in this community. You have lots of great options. It's just... You know, how, how are they linked? And I'll tell you a little bit of a story about my mother here in a little bit, but let me show the film first. So the, this is, is the roll call video that law enforcement officers did. They take the roll call. The following message is from the Center for Healthcare Services, proudly serving law enforcement and first responders in our community. If you have an intoxicated person on your hands, bring them here. Do you have an emergency detention? Bring them here. Do you have an injured prisoner that needs medical attention? Bring them here. Within the last few months, the Restoration Center has made tremendous efforts towards the speed and delivery of services for law enforcement officers in our community. Hello, I'm Brittany Berry, Clinic Administrator for the Mobile Crisis Outreach Team. 
we've made a number of improvements to assist law enforcement officers with prisoners and people in crisis on an ED needing medical attention. Over 1,400 people per month are diverted and connected to quality care in an effort to reduce arrests and emergency room visits. Welcome to the Restoration Center. Our goal is to provide fast service delivery in order to take the individual AP, inebriate, or ED off your hands, or provide medical attention to your prisoner so you can get in and out and back into service quickly. The Restoration Center cannot take violent individuals. They don't have seclusion or restraints. The Restoration Center does not take juveniles. If the person is seriously injured or suspected of an overdose, you should go to the nearest emergency room. Honestly, if the person is that seriously injured, EMS needs to transport them to the ER. Just remember, the rumor about calling ahead is not true. But if you do have questions, call this number. If you're not familiar with the location, 601 North Rio is downtown less than a mile from the mag. The entrance is off Haven for Hope Way. This is where you park. Whether you have an injured prisoner, an emergency detention, or an inebriate, they'll take them off your hands quickly and get you back on the streets as soon as possible. EDs, 15 minutes or less. Inebriates, no wait time, just drop them off. The place to sit down and write your report. Injured prisoners are served immediately, not like long waiting times in emergency rooms. 24 hours a day. Seven days a week. 365 days a year. At the Restoration Center, law enforcement is their primary customer. The Restoration Center thanks you for your service. That was easy. Yeah, they have it all here. We were in and out. I wonder why more guys won't use this place. No kidding. Maybe we could tell those guys at the Restoration Center to make a video so we can get the word out. And you know what? Me and you can even star in it. Nah, man. I'm too shy and you're too ugly. What? So uh, you can see uh, there are lots of customers, and if you really want to have a, a successful program, people have to work together. So uh, at one time before I took this job, I was a state official. I was the director of community services at the Texas Department of Mental Health Mental Retardation. And I did a lot of good stuff when I worked for the state, but I hated being a state bureaucrat. Uh, no, deed, uh, no good deed goes unpunished, you know. <laughs> And uh, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a therapist, I'm an operations person. So uh, this uh, Center for Healthcare Services was in bankrupt and was in the newspaper, all kinds of bad things uh, happening. So I decided that'd be my last hurrah. But when I worked for the state, I actually tried to, I became painfully aware about the criminalization of the mentally ill because we had a partnership and a relationship with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And I'm gonna prove to you in a little bit that treatment works. And I'm going to prove to you through the data, through the criminal justice system, it's not even my data. So uh, anyway, so when I was with the state, I actually funded some consultants to go to two different communities and try to get people to collaborate and work on this issue. I spent quite a bit of money, came up with really good plans, but when it got down to the actual operations, everybody in the community said, that, the, and I'm talking about the leaders, uh, of these organizations said, so that's a great plan and great idea, but not with my money or my staff. Okay, so uh, part of having a great community cl collaboration is who's going to make us do it. You know, so uh, if, if you remember after the, the World War uh, 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 bombing, there was a commission that investigated and what they found out is you had all these intelligence agencies basically doing the same thing, had the same mission you know, protecting, you know, the citizens of the United States. But they were so prideful that they wouldn't share their information with each other, right? And bad things happen. And they're the same business, paid by, you know, basically the federal government. Yet, there was no partnership there, there was no working together. So, having working partnerships and alliances, are, it's really a hard thing to do. So, when I went to Bear County, I knew that if I tried to pull together uh, all the leadership in the community, nobody would have shown up. And if somebody did show up, it could be somebody that could say no and not yes. It'd be somebody that didn't have any power. So I went to the county judge, who used to be the mayor, who was a state senator before that. I, I explained the problem, and he knew it was a huge problem anyway. And I said, Judge, would you be our champion? Would you bring people together and, and make us all work together? 
And of course, he's very bright. He said yes. And so he not only did that, but he got the mayor to co-sign the letter. So all these important people showed up because the, the judge asked them to. And we were smart enough to put a judge in charge of this, what we call jail, uh, jail diversion task force. And it's morphed into what we call the medical director's roundtable now. And uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, it gave us a chance to learn about each other and respect each other and learn about each other's missions. You know, you, 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 you know, if you just think about it, do law enforcement officers and mental health professionals have much in common? We, we really don't. I mean, it, you know, the public's good, I guess, is common and the public safety net. But we speak different languages. You know, we have a different mission. Um, you know, there's no uh, common bond between the two. So by the judge bringing us all together, making us work together, we got to know each other and learn about each other's needs. And so you can see here that film was all about making it convenient for law enforcement officers to do the right thing. Right, so you don't have to take them to jail anymore. You don't have to cuff them and stuff them. Uh, when a law enforcement officer and the public's most at risk is when they go on a mental health call, a family disturbance call, or some kind of racially motivated or uh, racially tense situation. You know, we just saw what happened in Ferguson, right? Where you had uh, all these officers in, in body armor and shields and armored cars. And you know, they're, the citizens that live there, you know, they pushed back. They didn't want to be treated that way. So, uh, you know, if, if you're psychotic and you got an officer in your face, you know, uh, uh, using their command voice, command presence, things go bad. You saw the shootings that happened in Albuquerque and other places. So these officers are trained in, in to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental illness or some kind of tense situation. They're given the skills in training to use de-escalation techniques, so they step back, use talk-down procedures, and find you know, some other alternatives. So uh, because of that, uh, our sheriff, who's a retired two-star general, she's very conservative. She not only has all her deputies trained in the 40-hour training, she has her jailers trained because she wants them to use verbal intervention when there's tension in the jail. Our police chief <coughs> uh, requires all his officers, including his command staff, to go through the training. He won't let you carry a taser unless you've been through the training because he wants you to use verbal intervention before force. So it really is kind of getting back to good community policing. You know, we kind of got away from that you know, many years ago and it's kind of bringing that back. Yeah, got it. So, uh, <coughs> let, let, let me, I, I, I told you, I was gonna tell you about my mother's story. So my parents went to Europe twice. And the second time, my mother was just thrilled about her trip to Europe. And so I said, you know, well, you went to different countries than the first time? She said, no, we basically went to all the same countries. Well, you went to different cities? No, pretty much all the same cities we went to the same time. Well, surely you went to different cathedrals and museums and sites? No, we pretty, went to, pretty well went to the same places. And I said, well, what was the difference in this trip? She said, the tour guide. I said, tour guide? She said, yeah, she said, the first trip, you know, uh, there's mainly older people and we have ambulatory problems and dietary problems and we are lugging our own luggage around and, and uh, no potty breaks and we're just kind of left on our own with something plugged in our ear. Mm -hmm. She said, this time, our luggage magically appeared in our room. You know, everybody's diet was met. The tour guide was on the bus explaining all the, the history of the places we, we were with. Uh, she was with us the whole time we had planned. Uh, restroom breaks, and I just learned so much about those cities and countries, it's so delightful. And so you too have all these wonderful cathedrals and museums and things like that. How, how do you put a tour guide together to make this all work together? You know, and that's, you know, that's kind of my theme, because when people come, that's the thing they're always amazed about, is how'd you get everybody to work together? So uh, the problem. <coughs> this this says up to 20% of people in jail. A lot more people in jail, 20% with severe mental illness. We all know that 25% uh, of everybody on, uh, on this earth has a diagnosable mental illness. They just go undiagnosed. So they're, they're uh, having problems with their families, they're having problems with their kids, they're drinking, they're drugging, they're getting fired, you know, you name it, uh, it's a problem. So uh, uh, it's, I would say at least over 30% of people in jails have mental illnesses. Uh, if you look at what they call disease burden, uh, both the, the uh, National Institute of Health 
in the World Health Organization and have looked at the diseases that cost society the most money in actual dollars and lost productivity. Mental illness is three of the top ten. You put substance abuse in there, like five of the top ten. So if you really want to save the taxpayers' dollars and improve the public safety net, improve the health of the community, you've got to find ways to engage these people. They're very ill and tend to be treatment resistant. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so uh, the average mentally ill person that goes to jail stays three or four times longer than a violent offender because they usually can't get bailed out. They don't have anybody there. They don't have a gang member or, or family members or, or whatever. <coughs> and uh, they end up many times being on suicide watch or going to a medical unit that costs three or four times more than the general population. So uh, the, the cost is very high. And when they're discharged, and most people are discharged, I think it's like 30% of people that are detained are actually convicted of crimes. So uh, if they're not hooked up into treatment when they are discharged, then they're going to decompensate and be in that vicious revolving door. Very expensive. So I'll, I'll go ahead now, <coughs> I've got a slide a little, little later, and talk about how I can prove to you that treatment works. So uh, in the late uh, 1970s, early 1980s, the Texas prison system was almost a profit center for the state of Texas. Yeah, we required all prisoners to work. You know, they raised their own food, they raised cattle, uh, they made their own shoes, they made their own clothing, they uh, renovated school buses, they made furniture. They practically had no staff. They had the building tender method. So they took the biggest, meanest SOB on every cell block and put them in charge. <laughs> and if they kept the peace, then they got good time or, or special consideration. And they reported to some subwarden. And, well, by the way, they had no medical services. So if you had cancer or some kind of horrific disease, you just suffered till you died. The problem with the building tender method is that a lot of people died. A lot of people got beat up. And so family members would get called and say, hey, a tree fell on your loved one. Of course, it's in the middle of the night. You know, come and get them. <clears throat> so this federal lawsuit happened. The judge was named William Wayne Justice, a great name for a judge, right? And uh, so the state, as part of the resolution settlement, had to build a whole bunch of 1,200 bed prisons, a bunch of them, actually staff them, have medical services, and you couldn't uh, you know, compel people to work without giving them some remuneration. And so <clears throat> being Texas and being conservative as we are, uh, we want to put lots of people in, in jail because we're tough on crime, right? So they built extra capacity. So it cost the state billions of dollars. And that extra capacity started filling up real fast. And the bill came home. And it was so expensive, the legislature started freaking out. Uh, that's a, not a Texas term. That's a, a, <laughs> that's a 60s term. And so they turned to the res researcher at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, a guy named Dr. Tony Fabello. And they said, Tony, tell us why you know, the prisons are filling up so fast. And so he and his staff looked at the prison population in depth, and they published a report for which our Governor Clements at the time promptly fired him for, because it basically said, you all are stupid. You have a bunch of people in prison that shouldn't be here. And he mentioned two groups specifically. One was nonviolent mentally ill offenders, and here's what he said. You know, a mentally ill, nonviolent mentally ill offender, they get no good time because they're hallucinating, they're hearing voices, so, they, you know, they can't obey the rules, so, and they're in lockdown a lot. They agitate the other prisoners. They make it difficult for folks. If their illness is finally identified, they go to some medical unit that costs more. And so you take the cost of whatever it is a date, multiply it times 365 times the number of years, and the episode is gigantic. And uh, besides that, they're taking up space for violent offenders, okay? And uh, so... Uh, the legislature did take Dr. Fabello's advice about one thing. He recommended that the Texas legislature create a new branch of the criminal justice system, and it's called the Texas Commission on Offenders with Medical and Mental Impairments. And what they used to do was go through the criminal justice system, find these people who shouldn't be in prison, and they put them on parole. A condition of their parole is they had to see my psychiatrist, they had to take their medication, they had to do their alcohol and drug screen disorder, and generally to stay in compliance with treatment, okay? Felons on parole, I know we have a lot of law enforcement people in the room and, and attorneys and other folks, uh, county officials. Uh, felons on parole, three to five years, revocation rates 40 to 60 percent. 
Yeah. In other words, they get rearrested and go back to prison. If you have a mental illness, it's a little bit higher. After five years, it's up to 75%. If you have a mental illness, it's a little bit higher. Guess what it is in Bear County when you get treated? This is not my number. This is a criminal justice number. It's 6.6%. Most of those are technical revocations where we go find the person and round them up and get them back in front of their parole officer. You know, so uh, treatment works, you know, if you can find a way to get somebody in treatment. And so we do a lot of conditional kinds of, of, uh, of uh, treatment. You know, we have uh, uh, restorative co courts, uh, the problem solving courts, I call it therapeutic justice, the veterans courts, children's courts, uh, mental health courts, uh, dr uh, drug and alcohol courts. And we also uh, have a civil court, you know, similar to Kinder's Law in New York. Uh, if, you, if you Google the cost of taxpayers of the homeless, you know, you think homeless people wouldn't cost you a lot of money, right? They're just out there panhandling and drinking and drugging and sleeping, you know, in your shelter with, that shouldn't cost too much, or under an awning or on the street. Uh, actually, the cheapest uh, uh, study I saw was $30,000 a year for a homeless person, taxpayers' dollars. The most expensive study I saw was done by the Scripps Center in San Diego, that famous uh, research center there, a Nobel Prize winner came out of there a couple years ago. And they did a study for San Diego County. They looked at their high utilizers, I think it was 256 people, it cost the county $16 million. So they're in emergency rooms, they're in and out of jail, uh, they get bedded in the hospital, and that's where the cost is. So people with severe mental illness die 25 years sooner than the general population. And so they never get to mental health treatment, but they never get to primary care. And they're doing all these things that are unhealthy. So they're smoking, they're drinking, they're drugging, they have poor, poor diets. So uh, when they do die, they're million dollar patients because uh, they're dying of congestive heart failure and liver disease and all those kind of things. In fact, Ma Malcolm Gladwell, the guy who wrote The Tipping Point, wrote an article for The New Yorker called Million Dollar Murray where he explains this. And that's one of the reasons that the study I just told you about, about the disease burden, you know, these illnesses cost society the most. And so if we really want to bend the, the cost curve and also help people reclaim their lives and their families, you know, we've got to do early intervention and prevention with, with this group. So uh, anyway, I just want to make the point that these people go untreated are very costly to society. They're very costly to their families. And uh, these are horrendous diseases that are treatable. So that's us in the police department, that first meeting. <laughs> but that's kind of what we know about is our community collaboration, you know. And, uh, I would, I would suggest to you that that's probably the biggest problem in Cook County. You know, you've got silos, you've probably got judges, law enforcement, the healthcare system, you know, all, all kinds of folks. And are you working together? Are you talking together? Are you collecting data on cost and outcomes? So we keep a lot of data. <coughs> and uh, uh, we have a continuous quality improvement. Uh, a situation. So we started with nothing, but over the years, this community collaboration, we just keep adding uh, parts, and I can uh, talk to you about that, and especially uh, around the question and answer time. So uh, the Gain Center talks a lot about the, the uh, intercept model, okay? And I, I can tell you what we do, because we don't have any money to speak of. We've, we decided we were in the second round of the SAMHSA jail diversion grants, and there were three rounds, and everybody wrote the same grant except for us. And so remember I told you we had this little work group, the jail diversion committee? Well, we had consumers and family members on that group, and we decided we want to write for this jail diversion. So we, we came up with some principles and some value statements. And one of the value statements is you shouldn't have to go to jail if you have an illness. So when we wrote the grant, we concentrated on training law enforcement officers and having an alternative to jail and emergency rooms or being put back on the street. So, and that's still, you know, over 24,000 people, you know, are diverted. <coughs> you, you, you saw it. So the second intervention point is at bookend. So when somebody gets arrested, and we're working with the Council of Governments right now, Dr. Fred Osher and some other folks, 
in uh, the county. So you, you saw Gilbert Gonzalez of the county. He actually worked for me, and the, and the county has found out they can save so much money here, and it's so important they've actually developed a new mental health division. They don't deliver any services, but they help do the planning and oversight and collect data. <coughs> so while we're, while we're doing it bookend, so before you get put in a jail, we have staff there under contract with the county who do mental health assessments. We also assess for dangerousness. So if you're, you know, if you're uh, determined that you have a severe mental illness and you're not at risk for some kind of alternative placement rather than jail, and we also at, at, at uh, bookend have access to what's called the care system. So if you've ever been treated in a state hospital in Texas or a community mental health center, you're in the care system. So we cross match there. Then we work with the magistrate and say, judge, this person has severe mental illness. You know, uh, it doesn't look like they would be a threat to themselves or other people. Would you consider a conditional release? You know, mental health bond, personal recognizance bond. And the release would basically say, hey, if you go get treatment, and you know, um, you know, uh, try to get your uh, life back. Then we're not going to put you in jail. There, there's an alternative there. So that's our second diversion point that we're working on fleshing out right now. We think there will be a huge number of people that will be diverted at that point. The third diversion point is there will be people who commit crimes that they're going to go to jail for. You know, you're just, you're, you know, whatever crime they did was serious enough that nobody's going to look past it. But they're probably going to get out of jail, right? So when they get out of jail, you want to make sure that you've endeared yourself to them, you've tried to hook them up into treatment, so when they get out, they don't decompensate and go right back in. So that's our third diversion point. And our fourth is working with the courts. And so uh, that, yeah, we try to make it simple uh, where it's not costly, and we found that those three intervention points work the best for us. This is too complicated. <laughs> this is the data that Chief Ortiz uh, kept about the amount of time that his officers were spending in emergency rooms waiting for medical clearance and psych evals. That's the, the uh, uh, data from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice on the revocation rates I just told you about. You know, Bear County is better than the rest of the state. But 30% is still lower than, uh, you know, the uh, traditional. Uh, Seventy-five percent. Uh, okay, return on investment. So we, we keep a lot of data, and uh, on on uh, what's working, not working, and also what it, it costs. So we have very conservative numbers. So we actually hired an independent medical economist, Dr. Michael Johnsrud, from the School of uh, Pharmacology, to come and do a study to prove the cost benefit. And he helped us with the formula. So the gel diversion, we kind of actually know. And this, you know, when he did the, the, the uh, first study, it was, you know, 10 years ago. So these numbers are very low. Same thing, we know what it costs for somebody to go to an emergency room. Uh, we also know what it costs for the people that were diverting from the city system, the registration cost and uh, the, the cost in the drunk tank and, and all that kind of stuff. And I talked a little bit about that because of that data. We actually get, the county gives us a lot of money, the city gives us a lot of money, and the hospital district gives us a lot of money because we save them so much more than what they give us. They see that's a good return on investment. Uh, two, two, uh, this is another great story. So in 2002, when we started this program, the Bear County Jail was being threatened to be shut down by the Texas Jail Standards Commission for overcrowding and deplorable conditions. Our commissioner's court had to go buy uh, jail uh, bed space from other counties. They brought in an expert that said, you need to build another thousand beds onto the Bear County Detention Center right now, the Bear County Jail. We started this program. Uh, last census, we grew by 350,000 people. And this year, we've had up to 1,000 empty beds in the county jail. Yeah, pretty amazing, huh? <clears throat> we, we, can't, we can't take credit for all that. I'd like to. But, you know, crime's down. There's, people are being a lot smarter about, you know, uh, uh, how they use jails. There are reentry programs. There are a lot of effective things out there. But when the county judge and other people speak about the bed, the bed day utilization at the jail, they give us 
uh, the majority of the credit uh, for these diversion programs. So I, I will uh, wait and answer questions. So I've got a lot more to tell you. I could talk for like three hours easily, but we have other panelists and I know we want to have time for questions because it's really not about what happens in Bear County, it's what happens in Cook County. So uh, thank you.